This morning we are in part five of our mini-series, Keeping Intimacy in Marriage. With that said, let's all stand together. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 27. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Last week, we looked at how Potiphar's wife, a pagan Egyptian woman, tried to seduce Joseph into adultery. This morning, we're going to look at another individual who was anything but pagan. In fact, the Bible gives him the title of a man after God's own heart. And yet, this same individual... In a moment of weakness, in a moment of lust and pride, he threw away his conscience, he threw away his character, and he became worse than an infidel. Of course, you know who I'm talking about, King David. Adultery is a very serious sin. We're living in a culture and a society where it is the norm. I mean, we got bigger sins. It's like bigger fish to fry. Adultery, man, that's, that's normal. Let me ask you some questions this morning before we dive into this passage. How seriously do you take the sin of adultery? Do you realize the tremendous consequences that follow? They keep coming. It doesn't end with that affair. They keep coming. They keep transferring into your children and your grandchildren. Here's a deeper question. Do you even hear the voice? You see, if there isn't the Holy Spirit telling you to back off, means you do not have the Holy Spirit, which means you are lost. You see, when you receive Christ as your Savior, you don't have just a conscience. You also have a comforter with you who guides you, who enables you, who helps you. Are you saved? This morning, we're going to look at the account of King David and Bathsheba. And we're going to learn how easy it is, even for a Christian, to fall into this sin. And we're going to understand how awful are the consequences when you do fall into this sin. But if I stop there, that's just half the message. Christianity is not just about man, he messed up and he's getting what he deserves, or she messed up and it's coming back to haunt her. Christianity is also about forgiveness. That when you do turn to God, he even takes the messes of your life and he builds something beautiful. It is a story of redemption, where all things, even our sins, work together for our good in the hand of God. Let's begin with that. Number one, from glance to gaze. Listen to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the people of Ammon and they besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It is time for kings to go to battle, but David is playing hooky, and he is in Jerusalem. Hey, listen, the enemy will always find stuff for idle hands. If you have too much time on your hands, he will find something on the computer screen. He will find some relationship. He will find somehow to give you something to do, which usually turn, doesn't turn out for the best. 
So he is at home instead of being in the battle. Then listen to what happens in verse 2. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. I mean, this is in the middle of the night. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam? The way these guys answered that question, it was almost like, don't you know her? I mean, you're supposed to know her. Now, who was Eliam? In 2 Samuel chapter 23, we have a list of David's mighty men. This is David's elite fighting force. I mean, these guys are like Rambo on steroids. When you go down the list of the names, guess what you find? Eliam is mentioned in that list. Bathsheba's father was one of David's special forces. In the same chapter, it tells us that he was the son of Ahithophel, the Gilonite. Now, who was Ahithophel? In 2 Samuel 16, it tells us that Ahithophel was David's counselor. He was David's personal advisor. Bathsheba's grandfather, when he spoke, it was as if God spoke. That should have been enough for David to say, Oh, man, off limits. Y'all forget about the whole thing. Go home. It's good. I'm good. But there's something else these men told David when they came back. They said, um, she's the wife. Just the word the wife should have been enough for David to say, oh, really? Oh, I didn't know she was married. Okay, all right, it's all good. But they said she is the wife, and they even identify who the husband is, Uriah the Hittite. Now, who was Uriah the Hittite? Remember that list of David's mighty men? Folks, that would have been reason enough for me and some of us to say, All right, I'm off the list. Not only can his dad whoop me, even her husband can beat me up. Still, David did not give up. Sometimes people say things like, man, I was so overwhelmed with temptation, I just could not control myself. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. When somebody says, man, I was so mad, you won't understand if, you, if you've never been, somebody else has been through it. People have been through it and they have overcome it. You can too. But something else it says, listen, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation. He will also make the way of escape. In every temptation, there is a hatch open for you to walk out. The problem is, when the Holy Spirit opens the door, do we take it? What do you do when the Holy Spirit makes the way of escape? Do you pray, lead us not into temptation. God, I don't want to go down this road. Help me. David didn't pray. And his glance became a gaze. What happens next? From entitlement to murder. Verse 4. Then David sent messengers. This is the fourth look. And they took her. And she came to him. And he lay with her. Sometimes people say, you know, oh, Bathsheba, man, she was trying to seduce him and bathe. No, it had nothing to do with her. He was the king. He was the monarch. He got what he wanted, and he wasn't going to listen. And there was a reason why he wasn't going to listen. It's going to come later. He justified it. Bring her to me. Uh, What do you think were his reasons for justification? I came up with three. Now, it's my opinion, but these are my opinions, okay? One reason I think David said to himself, maybe I'm doing her a favor. You'd be surprised how men think. I'm doing her a favor, man. She's in a messed up marriage. I'm helping her out. After all, she's married to some Hittite. I mean, people on the other side of the track. She's married to a Hittite. I'm doing her a favor. What David didn't realize is 
Uriah's name is not a Hittite name. It's a Hebrew name. Of course, his family might have been Hittites. Uh, Hittites lived in modern-day Turkey. Some of them lived in the south in Canaan. But through the influence of God's people, many of them actually got saved. You know the name Uriah actually means Jehovah is my light. No Hittite would ever name himself the God of Israel is my light until or unless they actually got saved. But at this moment, it didn't matter to him. Listen, Uriah is a convert. The last thing you should do is to take his wife to David. It didn't matter. You know when Christians sin, we don't just eat out of the barrel. We eat right through the barrel. That's how dirty we get. That's why when people say, man, when Christians, I tell you, no, when, when we sin, we know better, but we still keep going because we know we can stretch it all the way. Maybe another reason, maybe he thought he could, nobody would ever know. He could cover it up. You know, the, the punishment for adultery was what? Death by stoning. They never stoned David. You know why they never stoned him? Because to, to stone somebody, you need two witnesses. Now, so, I often wonder, you know, who was going to get up and say, David has committed adultery. I'm witness number one. You know what I mean, <laughs> you'd be dead. But I think also... David covered up this sin very well. People did not know about it. Maybe that was his justification. Nobody knows. Another justification I believe he might have used is, I'm entitled to it. After all, look what I've done for these people. Look how much I work for my family. Look what I do for my wife. Look, I don't get the respect I deserve, so I'm doing this. i got to do for me sometimes. It is me time. You know how people think? You don't know what I've gone through. So listen, no matter what you've been through, you are still not entitled to sin. Amen? What happens next? Bathsheba got pregnant, and she sent word to David, I'm with child. What David should have done at that moment is repent. Repent. He should have immediately got on his face before God and said, God, would you forgive me? But he did not do that. He went into damage control. You know what damage control is? What we do when we mess up, it's like, so how can I rationalize this sin? How can I cover this up? He sent word to Joab, his commander, and said, uh, send Uriah home for a little R&R. I can imagine Joab saying, R&R, man, we, we just got here. Uriah comes home. David says, go home, man. Be with your wife. Spend time with her. Uriah says, I can't do it. My men are out in the field fighting. I'm here. I don't know why. I'm not going to my wife. The word comes back to David that he actually slept at his doorstep. And David's like, man, what do I got to do to get this man to go home and sleep with his wife? It'll be off my case. The child is hers and his is all over. So you know what David does? Listen to verse 13. He called him. Uriah, come over to the palace tonight. But I want you to hear those words and read them with me if you can. David ate and drank before him. What else? And he made him drunk. There is a reason why David could not go in battle. David was struggling with alcohol. There is a reason why he is up in the middle of the night walking on his rooftop. There is a reason why when people come and tell him, hey, listen... She is married. <laughs> uh, she's Eliam's daughter. 
She is Ahithophel's granddaughter. You know why he is not listening to any of that? He cannot. He is drunk. He is wasted. And what's worse is that he gets this man over and not only gets drunk himself, but he also gets Uriah drunk. Now, this is the point where you're going to stop loving me. But I don't think you come here because you love me. You come here because you hear the truth. Amen? Yeah, that's a very weak amen. Maybe you do love me. That's all right. I want to make a statement here that hopefully will help some of you someday, even if you don't appreciate it today. Alcohol dulls your senses. I mean, think about it. If the party is going boring past the glass, and all of a sudden people get so happy. I mean, they are... They begin to talk crazy. They, there, are, there are no more fears, inhibition, shame. They do whatever comes. No. Are you all with me? Are you catching this or is this just going right over? Alcohol dulls your senses. Here's a little formula that has helped me a lot. Alcohol plus opportunity equals adultery. This man wrote Psalm 23. He is a man after God's own heart. He understands right from wrong, but at this moment, nothing is connecting. You know why it's not connecting? His senses are gone. People tell me, oh, I tell you what, alcohol is not wrong. It's when you overindulge. I told you, you're not going to like me after this message, but that's okay. It'll save your life one day. Alcohol is not bad. It's overindulging in alcohol. That's bad. Anything you do in excess, man, that's where you get in trouble. Gluttony is wrong. Here's what I tell them. I've seen people get pulled over for driving drunk. I've never seen anybody getting pulled over for overeating. Right? Sir, we need, to, we need to check your license for driving fat. <laughs> what is this extra large French fry doing in your back seat? I mean, nope. Why, why do you get pulled over? Even if you have a little bit, I want you to, you know, why, why do they do that? Because if you are under the influence, you are not to be trusted behind the steering wheel. Let me ask you a question. If you're under the influence, can you be trusted in your relationships? You know why I don't drink? I don't trust me. I don't trust myself. <laughs> it runs in our family. I don't trust myself. David, why is he doing these things? Why is he not fighting? He's a fighter. I mean, this little boy killed, when he was a little boy, he killed a lion and a bear by his bare hands. He killed a giant. I mean, this man killed tens of thousands. Why is he not fighting? He is stuck to the bottle. Why is he not backing off when, when he is being tempted? Hey, listen, the enemy knows your weakness. An unguarded strength is a double weakness. But he's about to do something even worse. You know what he did? He gave a sealed letter to Uriah to take to Joab. And that letter, <laughs> I mean, he's really drunk, had letter had instructions on killing Uriah. His conscience is so dull, his senses are so gone, he's actually sending the man with his own death warrant. And what's the plan? Get Uriah right up to the wall, and when the ba battle gets going, rest of y'all fall back, let him die. <laughs> if David was sober in a million years, he would have never done that. He was not sober. Let me ask you a question this morning. Can you be trusted? 
How do you justify your sins? Do you think you, you owe it to yourselves to indulge in sin? How far do you think you will go to cover up your tracks? Here's the problem. Why do I preach against it? I'm not a prohibitionist. Because Western culture is dying. Western culture is dying with the bottle. And the wrong people are rising up all over the world. Now they're headed to Europe. And we're dying. And we're happy about it. From glance to gaze, from entitlement to murder, but here comes number three, from discipline to restoration. Bathsheba cried. She mourned. Why? Because she didn't want to be with David. She wanted to be with her husband. When she got news about it, she, she began to mourn. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. You know what David is thinking? It's all good. It's done. It's covered. And she bore him a son. But I love this line. This line sends cold chills down my spine. But the thing... The thing that David did displeased the Lord. I wasn't in my right mind, God says. doesn't matter. What you did, David, was wrong. You know why the Bible is, not, is unlike any religious book, whether it's the Gita or the Quran or the Upanishads or all the religious books? Because the Bible never flatters its heroes. It always tells it like it is. Any other religious books, they build up their heroes. Not with the Bible. It's the Word of God. It's the truth. What David did, God said, it displeased me. And so what's the answer? David, uh, God sent a prophet by the name of Nathan to David. Go talk to him. Nathan came and said, David, I got a story for you. Two men. One was rich, one was poor. The rich man had a big flock of lambs and herd of sheep. The poor man had one ewe lamb. And he treated that lamb like a daughter. The rich man had a visitor. But instead of taking a lamb from his flock, he took the poor man's only lamb and killed it and cooked it. What do you think should happen to this wicked man? Listen to what David said. David was angry, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has, does, has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold. Be careful what you say. Remember that number, fourfold. For the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. That's called in psychology terms, the Freudian projection. You know what a Freudian projection is? Sometimes you're mad at things in your life, but when you see it in somebody else, you're even more mad. That's why you get so angry with your children. Anybody here get angry with your children? Because you see them doing things, you're like, man, stop doing that. Because you, you don't know what I had to go through it. But you see it. So David is angry. Listen to Nathan's famous line. You're the man. It's you. Oh, I'm sorry. Listen to what God said to David. He said, David, I gave you everything. I mean, you were just a little shepherd boy. Your, your parents would not even bring you in the house when Samuel came to anoint you. I made you king. I gave you all this. But you do this? Listen to the judgment. The sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me. God didn't say, David, you disobeyed me. God said, David, you hated me. See, when you and I disobey God as Christians, God says, why do you hate me? Oh, I, don't, I don't hate you. I, I mean, I love. No, when you disobey me, you hate me. What did Jesus say? If you love me, Keep my commandments. If you disobey me, you hate me. Because of this, 
I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. Means your children will fight each other constantly. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, David. But I will do this thing before all Israel before the sun. <laughs> you try to cover it up. I'm going to uncover it. And what's the price? Remember what David said fourfold? He killed one Uriah. Did you know David's four sons had to die? Of course, the first baby. Then came Amnon, David's son. He was killed in battle by his brother Absalom. Then Absalom was killed in battle, another of David's son. And then Adonijah. Another David's son was killed by his own brother, David's son, Solomon. Four for the price of one. Remember what David said? Hey, four times you got to get him. God said, okay, there you go. There's an old principle from Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Dear friends, please remember that. What goes around, comes around. And when it comes around, you cannot direct it which way it needs to go and who it needs to land on. You wish and you beg and say, God, let it fall on me. Unfortunately, many times it falls on those next to you. And the next to you usually are your children. You see, sin is so bad. Sin is so wrong. When you say, I heard the message, but I'm going to still do my thing, go ahead and do it. Just know this. When it comes back, you cannot redirect it. All things are lawful to me, but all things are not good for me. And David gave this response that I wish all of us would have. I have sinned against the Lord. This is why he was a man after God's own heart. When God says, you are the man, he didn't say, well, wait a minute now, wait a minute now. It wasn't me. Now, she was out there bathing. I mean, no, he said, I have sinned against you, God. And then if you ever read Psalm 51, what a powerful psalm. David prays, have mercy on me, God, according to your loving kindness. Blot out my transgression. Wash me. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. And then he says, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice again. I mean, this is a real penitence prayer. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. I mean, this is how you and I should pray when we sin. Not just adultery, but any sin. God, cleanse me, restore me, help me. I need your grace. What is the answer? Okay. The Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. You know, I don't know why people don't become Christians. Because Christianity is so amazing that when you do sin, not that you don't have consequences, but God even takes your failures and He works them together for good. <laughs> 